welcome to this uh, next session, uh, which is done obviously by uh, Richard Schroeter. And he has also been, uh, well, on so many early occasions uh, with us at, uh, at Integrate. And he has been rewarded uh, with uh, 12 MPP, uh, sorry, MVP awards for all contributions to the, to the community. In today's session, Richard gives an overview of the landscape and offers advice on how to connect things in which scenarios. And that's really it from my side. So please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for joining. I, this is one of my favorite audiences to talk to every year. You may know me from classic books like the SOA Patterns book for BizTalk 2009, or you may now know me as a filthy, disgusting trader who works for Google. But uh, either way, hopefully the next 30 minutes or so will be somewhat informative, entertaining as we talk about this when to use what conversation. Because I did a talk on this at Integrate, I think in 2014. A lot's changed in six years. I thought I would take a refresh on that. So I read a good book last year. It's called The Paradox of Choice. I'd encourage you all to check it out as well. The point being that, you know, obviously for us, we face a lot of choices, but in this book, the talk it was a lot that the choice is great, right? We demand choice, we need choice, our satisfaction comes from choices. But too many choices actually drive us crazy, right? That the tyranny of small decisions, oh, I'll just look at one more thing, I'll try this one more thing. At some point you almost become overburdened by having so much choice to make. And one of the key points in the book was you almost have to choose when to choose, right? That that's a really important choice we have to make. You have to make an active choice of will I be choosing something or can I just go with this or go with that? And so a lot of this talks gonna be about not just choosing when to choose, but choosing how to choose. What's a good framework? What's the right frame of mind for thinking about choosing the right integration tech? Because there's just so many choices right now. And so one of the things, especially as you all create frameworks or decision models for choosing the right integration tech, you're gonna choose some constraints, sometimes on purpose, right? I'm only gonna do this for this sort of workload. I'm not gonna evaluate all the options again every time I have a new project. So that sort of constraints is a good thing. Constraints are empowering. They often foster creativity. So let's look at some things. I'm going to cover a few things today because I, I'll, I want all of you all to feel like you're choosing the right tech for the right problem, right? One tech doesn't solve everything anymore. So this is a hard thing, especially now. There's so many choices, so many things to do. So I'm going to cover three things here in our, our time together. I'm going to go over a few technology trends that I think matter the most for integrators. Then we'll look at some of the decision criteria for how do you choose a good integration technology. And then I'll look at some of the options today and score them against that decision criteria. And then of course, yell at me along the way in the chat if you uh, disagree with any of it. So what are the trends that matter, especially as an integrator? Multi-cloud, right? This is 80% from Gartner survey using multiple providers today. You're gonna have an A and a B, a primary choice and a secondary choice. That's pretty standard. It's not that you're gonna split your workloads among cloud providers. That, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So you're gonna use best of breed from different things. You're gonna have different business units. You're gonna be doing different things for different geographies. Makes tons of sense. As an integrator, this means your endpoints will never be homogenous. You're still gonna keep consuming things in lots of different infrastructure. To Kubernetes world, we're just living in it, right? This is everywhere. Uh, recent state of Kubernetes survey showed of large enterprises, 60% are using Kubernetes today. Many are getting to production. What's interesting is many are using a lot of different clusters. It's not a single cluster. So as an integrator, some of your components you're gonna talk to are gonna sit here. You're gonna be talking to different clusters, things that change all the time because containers come and go. So even as an integrator, Kubernetes is gonna impact your world. Microservices, not a new thing, but it's interesting too, as you look at the data, companies are embracing this model, which again, to you means there's more types of things you're gonna integrate with. There's different granular services. You're not maybe calling one big thick service with a bunch of APIs. You're gonna be calling a lot of different things built and changed constantly. You might see more iteration on the message payloads. You might see more changes on the shape of a service or it's how it responds to things. So all of a sudden this world of where services only change once every few years, that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. So change is the new normal. Managed services. So what's interesting too, again, another uh, Gartner report kind of predicted by 2024, we're gonna see more than 80% of enterprises shift a lot of their migration work to manage platforms, right? It's not just about moving my integration bus from this infrastructure provider to this one. It's saying, I wanna get rid of the infrastructure management entirely if I can, or at least switch it to a managed service where I'm not doing the patching, carrying and feeding of infrastructure. Maybe I'm doing scaling exercises, backup, DR, HA, higher level order things because I'm using a managed platform. 
as an integrator, that means your integration service may move, that may mean your endpoints may move, but we are moving to a world where you should be managing less of the infrastructure and more of the application tier. Low code, I mean, every year has been the year of low code, I think since I started working 20 years ago, but maybe it just happened and we didn't even notice. But by 2024, again, the prediction, 65% of app development will be low code. And what does that mean? Is that drag and drop logic apps? Is that using Salesforce? Is that different definitions? But this idea, especially as this sort of low code citizen integrator, which is a silly term, but as these sort of things do take shape, I think it just means more people are coding. So maybe even this, the number of things we build now with you know, C Sharp, Java, whatever, isn't gonna change, but now more people are coming in who can use these low code tools. I think edge computing is interesting stuff. As we move more to edge architectures where you're thinking about not just IoT, but you're putting different data caches at the edge, you're integrating with edge endpoints, you're streaming more data into some sort of central location. This is gonna become more normal. You're not just gonna say, hey, I just use this cloud in this region. You're probably gonna distribute your workloads more widely or your customers will. And you've got to think about how do I integrate differently when I have so many distributed pools of information. Open source, and maybe my numbers are backwards here in terms of the increase is open source, right? So the number here, the percentage decrease from 2019 to 22 of proprietary software use. So 55% in 2019, uh, going down, I think 42% in 2020, 32% in 2022, there is a move towards open source. Not shocking stuff, but it's moving a little quicker than I think I would have even thought, which is gonna impact the things you talk to, the tools themselves that you use, as enterprises are more and more comfortable using open source tech, they're moving away from some of the proprietary systems. And then modernization, name of the game, right? Everybody's talking about this right now and is an ongoing, for me, modernization is a lifestyle choice. It's not a project. You're always modernizing, right? That's, the, that's what you're supposed to do, whether you're making your tech better. I think I did a modernization talk here last year. It's an ongoing effort. effort but most companies are putting a lot of attention into this and you're modernizing your integration, you're modernizing your endpoints, you're modernizing your infrastructure ops, modernizing your team skills. That's a nonstop thing. And as an integrator, that's a great thing. It also means again, changes the new normal. So what decision criteria might you use? How do you think about choosing the right integration tech? You've got endless choices. There's over a hundred iPads providers, integration platform as a service that Gartner tracks. Like that's crazy. There are so many options out there. How do you start to decide for your use case what the right thing is? So I'll count down eight of them. So payload characteristics. And you might ask a few questions. Is this an event stream or is this kind of a series of messages I'm just getting one off? Is this batch or real time need? Can I just you know, tolerate you know, a load of data every two hours? Am I getting something nightly? Or is there some sort of constant drip of information. How late, latency sensitive? How long do I have to need to wait for things or do I need something in that destination system or does it have to be immediate? Can it wait a few hours? That's gonna impact what you're gonna choose. Are there certain quality of service requirements? Do I need to have a retry, retry policy, guaranteed deliveries, You know, sort of things where, hey, I can't just drop messages. I actually need to make sure things get from A to B. These are business transactions. These are orders. I can't lose that. If I can, hey, it's transient data. It's always just kind of flowing through. That would change my decision. So payload characteristics, you know, one of these things you're gonna look at right away to help you make a choice. You'll look at your endpoint type, on-prem, right? Is it on-prem kind of proprietary APIs or not? Am I talking to a public cloud? Where, where is it? Is it a managed service that just gives me a fixed endpoint? So is this some sort of like, hey, here is the API for this CRM system, this payroll system, whatever, I have to talk to it. I have to figure out its weird, weird authentication scheme. That's up to me. Am I creating the endpoint? Am I actually creating an on-prem endpoint that I can, I'm going to integrate with? It does REST, it does gRPC, it does whatever else. What am I dealing with here, right? So that endpoint type, the shape of it, that's gonna play a big part in what tool you're gonna to select. Do you need workflow? Is this just data from A to B? Or is there some sort of processing step in between? Do I need logic? Because again, I'm seeing a kind of a fork, I guess pun intended, in some of this where in some cases it's just like, look, process, process, process versus, hey, if then else sort of conditions, while loops. Those are very different workflows, right? So do I have a data pipeline or do I have just a series of actual kind of business logic, long running workflow? Both are valid. One might be unnecessary if you're trying to accomplish something. 
is the logic distinct from the transport channel? For this, for this I mean, do I care how it comes in or how it goes out? Is the logic independent of that? Or for some reason is the sort of, do I need to know that this was an HTTP message and I'm reading HTTP headers? Or could it have come in from a queue, an HTTP message, a file system? Does it matter? Does my logic care about the transport? Again, that can impact my choice. What's the volume, right? Something that works fine for five messages a second might completely tip over and collapse when you send 500. What am I dealing with here? What is the sort of process of volume of both the workflow running at the same time and of the data passing through? What's my rate of change of the system? Do the schemas change a lot? Am I dealing with message definitions that are always kind of tweaking or are these fixed? These things never change. Do the endpoints themselves change a lot? Do they actually move around? Do they change security schemes? Are they changing caching policies? Or again, these pretty fixed things that you deploy once and you, have, you patch them once a year. That's fine. How often am I changing the input sources for an integration? Is it always this source, this, this destination? Or am I changing over time, adding new sources? Maybe it's partners and the you know, partners come and go. What's the frequency of that? Again, I'm gonna choose different things if the rate of change is different. And then this is interesting as you design some of these systems, how much do components change together? If I make a change to an integration, do I change all of it? Am I changing message definitions, components, you know, endpoint definition? Do I do this monolithic redeploy or can I do targeted surgical updates to my, my integration components? If I don't need to, if it can all change as one thing, fine. But do I have a different rate of change where certain things are changing all the time, other things have been constantly fixed. If that's the case, again, I might choose a different tool that gives me the option to selectively deploy changes. Portability. I mean, this is one when I looked at my list from 2014, I didn't include because I don't think we talked about it much. But as I think about my integration, I'm choosing what technology to use. Do I need it to run in containers? There's a lot of integration services now that do run in a Kubernetes environment. They run in different places, even the, some of the components, like there's a TIBCO piece that can run in the container. Interesting. Do I need that? Is that a part of my infrastructure where that's gonna be a decision criteria? From an overall portability perspective, is this thing ever gonna move? Or am I good? Like when I install BizTalk in this environment, is it gonna be here till I die? Or I mean, am I fine with this? Or do I expect that, look, wherever it's going now is a temporary home. And so whatever I install, I have to think about this thing's going to move. Even if it's moving providers, maybe from on-prem to cloud, these things seem to matter. Is it open source from a portability perspective? If something's open source, you have a different sort of vendor portability as well, right? If this vendor gets weird with me from a you know, cost perspective, or I don't like their service or their service level agreements, I need to use something else. Or is it proprietary software? And it says like, this is how I get support for it. And that's what it is. If I don't like it, I have to switch entire ecosystems. Again, it may not matter, but if you're looking for something and you actually have these sort of portability concerns, then you might be looking at something with an open source base. And then just how do devs get access to this? How portable is this thing? Is this a, I have to hire specialists to install this thing. Everyone just uses the same shared thing because I can't get a dev machine or I can't get a, a clone of this for local development or an emulator or any of that. This only runs in some mega central place. How do I get access? Or is it as a service where I just click a button and I get a, an environment? Do I need it? So again, these are all questions to ask. These shouldn't all be yes. They shouldn't all be no, but these are things I would be asking even project by project as I'm deciding what kind of integration I need to do. What's the operations burden? Who owns the integration? I mean, the biggest tweak with DevOps and things over these last few years is who owns what? Because as a developer, I might own down to the platform now. I don't just do my project, throw it over the fence and leave. In many cases, I have product teams. I have app teams, right? Service teams and that build and run their software. But do I have to run the whole thing? Am I going down to the metal? I hope not. Actually, I don't think that's a great way of doing DevOps. Can I actually run this down to the platform? So who owns the integration? If I'm using an integration platform, maybe the app team owns, updates that integration, and the platform team runs the platform. They run BizDoc. They run the integration service. That would be, it's a modern model. How is that, are you doing that right now? Are the deployments super complicated? Like, do you celebrate after a deployment because it's such a heroic effort? Or is it kind of boring and dev teams can do it? Or frankly, it can happen through automation. Check it into Git, pipeline kicks off, things go to prod. Again, that kind of how complicated is this might determine, well, this is a solution that's going to be kind of small for our team. We can't expect ops to help us. 
well, maybe we shouldn't pick the tool that has complicated deployments. How autom automation friendly is this thing, right? How easily can I automate the integration and specifically some of the platform around it? Can I do upgrades and patching and maintenance in a somewhat automated way? Or again, is this something where we just have to do a big project once a year to take care of these things? Maybe that's fine because you have a big ops team that can run the platform. But if you're a nimble, small team, you might choose integrations that have a simpler, smaller ops burden. Then you look at available skills. How many people know this thing? Right, I mean, that's gonna play a part. You just can't abstractly say, we're gonna use technology X. I don't know, maybe nobody knows it. Like that's a big risk to take on as an organization. Now, we're all gonna learn new things all the time. That's why we go to conferences. That's why this stuff is awesome. What's the learning curve? Is this, I'm gonna have to, you know, go off and live in a commune for six months to learn this technology because it's that intense? Or am I picking it up in a series of workshops and I'm somewhat functional even in a few days or weeks? What's the ecosystem look like? Am I the first one doing this thing? Or are there a lot of tools that plug into my development environment? Are there third-party components, training, all those kind of fun things? What is the overall support system for users? Right, this is a business critical thing with a timeline attached. I probably don't wanna be the first one using the shiny new open source thing that no one's ever put in production before. So these are gonna be factors as well. And then finally, what's the strategic value? I, I don't think you pick any technology for the most part, unless it's somehow either improving your, your time to market or lowering your cost. Otherwise, what are we doing? Like that's the only reason we're all you know, working for companies in business for the most part, is I'm either trying to deliver value faster or lower my cost, which also is a way of delivering value. Is this helping that? Is there support available or is this just, hey, you know, live your life, do it on your own? Does this actually take advantage of something we've invested in before? Hey, if you're a Microsoft shop, you're probably gonna potentially build on that. That makes sense. You're a Google shop because you make great choices. That's fine, you can use Google stuff. Does this align with your company goals? What is your company trying to do? If you're not trying to be the best at building platforms, don't build platforms. That's a waste of your time. What is the right thing that your company's after? You're trying to help patients, you know, improve financial stuff, do whatever your company's goal is doing. Is this helping? So if I look at the landscape of tech in this and kind of look at that criteria, how do we, how do we grade that? So lots of different tech out there, of course. So we look at things like queuing engines. We all know these things. We know and love them, right? Why do I use them? I'm trying to decouple senders and receivers. I like sort of pub sub transmission, right? That with data that goes away once I've read it. It's not a database. It's something where, hey, the data is processed, it's important, and then it goes away. And I get certain valuable things, right? We like queues because I get some durability, smart routing. I can do filtering, policies on retries, things like that. Tons of things in this space. Hey, obviously things like Service Bus, Google Cloud Pub Sub, Amazon SQS, right? The on-prem sort of software solutions. Tons of things there. If I were grading these, these things are pretty good at batch in bulk. Not, I mean, not really. I'm not going to send through 20 gigabyte files, but I can do some batch processing. They're good for real-time low latency. I don't put it as 100% because there's still some latency as part of these engines, right? I'm not doing something with two milliseconds of processing because I'm going through some stages. So these are near real-time solutions, absolutely. Great at things like guaranteed delivery, quality of service. That's why I'm using these things. If that's a requirement I have for my decision criteria, great solution here. Uh, connectivity for cloud endpoints. Yes, yeah, some of them if they're in the cloud not all in the cloud sense, but many of these don't have an adapter framework. So you're gonna to talk to whatever protocol it offers, HTTP, AMQP, whatever it is, it's fine, like that works, same with on-prem. So it's not specialized for these things, not an adapter framework, but you should be able to talk to it. Some basic Saga-based workflow stuff, but really these aren't tools to do workflow. You might be able to chain together a series of activities because they do support things like headers and routing based on headers, but they're not a workflow tool. Some of these, especially <clears throat> some of the cloud ones, more CI CD friendly, a little bit container friendly. I mean, more and more you're seeing some of these tools available in containers, at least the installable software ones. Many of these do have automated operations, especially the cloud ones, where I can provision, upgrade, manage them. And these have pretty widely available skill sets. If I need to do this sort of work, I can find people who do it. Now, if I look at event stream processors, this is an interesting space. And Obviously with event grid and event hubs and lots of tools in this space, Kafka, this is this idea of almost an inside out database where I've got a persistent log which people attach to and kind of read the information from it. It's not really routing, it's not really a pub sub engine. 
but I'm doing these kind of non-destructive reads from a shared lock. So it's targeted towards scale, event-driven architectures, lots of things here as well, right, that play well in this space. This is a great solution, again, if you're trying to do a different type of processing. Better at batch in bulk, I can go back and rewind and pull, you know, the last four days from the log, which is nice. So you get a nice story here. Again, would I still process gigabytes and gigabytes, petabytes of data? Probably not. It's not a database, but at the same time, it's supportive of, of more batch. Not really a real-time tool. I mean, these things can process things quickly, absolutely no doubt. But you're still putting, again, a, a step in between where you have people who are pulling data, pushing data. It's, it's near, it can be near real-time, but not as, as close as just direct real-time. Some delivery guarantees, although it puts a lot more responsibility on the client. The client might have to maintain a cursor. Client might need to figure out what it needs to read. So yes, you can kind of do you know, at least one, sometimes even exactly once delivery with some of these, but in some cases it's, it's more onerous on the client. Connectivity, sure, right? Again, not as many adapter frameworks for these things. They're just there and you can talk to them. Again, some workflow similar to queuing, they're not really workflow tools, but you can chain some of this stuff together. Some good support for CI, CD. Like it's getting there for some of these tools. A little bit in containers. Again, I'm seeing some support for this. I'm not sure too many people are running this in production. It's a little more science projecty. More automated ops is definitely getting there. And I think this skill sets here, I think it's really easy to use some of these tools, but to know how to use them right is different. And how is the right way to do an event driven architecture? What's the right way to use a log? If you are trading, you know, your queuing system straight up for an event stream processor, but doing the same thing, you might be doing it wrong. So I think this is more an architectural skill set challenge than a technology one. That's fine. We're all learning together. Now, what, there are times where I need a workflow or a data pipeline tool. And look, I'm doing this because I have a series of steps I need to do to process data to integrate systems. These do typically have more of a connector library. And so Google Cloud Composer is a neat tool, Azure Logic Apps, Spring Cloud Dataflow, a lot of workflow tools that I want to build processing pipelines or do some stateful processing. And these can work with batch and bulk, especially some of the data processing ones. Somewhat real time, but again, near real time, it's not gonna be exactly that. You are getting some delivery guarantees here. This isn't just fire and forget stuff. You're getting some actual stateful processing. There's more connectors here. So you are getting connectivity, same with on-prem. Clearly it better be good for workflow if I'm calling it workflow. So this is something where yes, it's designed for this. Some, some CI CD, again, Good, getting better. Not really container solutions here yet, kind of, but again, it's still early days for some of these tools. Uh, some automated operations, absolutely. And I think the skill sets are there. From what I've seen, these are, you know, again, still growing, but these are fairly quick and easy tools to pick up. Not a, not a huge, steep learning curve. Integration brokers. Now, if we go something bigger here, this is what we're, a lot of us are familiar with. These are these full featured engines that have routing and connectors and orchestration and B2B tooling, right? This is not designed for bulk stuff, but it's designed for sort of a constant stream of information. Hey, we know all the things we know and love in this space. They play a big part here. They can do batch in bulk. We've joked in years past. I mean, we've all probably tried to send that one gigabyte message through BizTalk server. I mean, I have, I, I'm not a proud of it, but they can do it. Don't do that. That's probably not what it's meant for. Again, real-time, low latency, near real-time, right? I could do very quick processing through this. You get great delivery guarantees. A lot of these tools are very good about resilience, not losing messages, making sure you have some real stability there. More and more, seeing some of these connectors to cloud-hosted endpoints, not perfect, but you're getting more and more connectivity to hosted services. They're really good at on-premises, right? A lot of connectors and protocol support for things that run on-premises. Many of these have workflow baked in, Getting there on continuous delivery sort of tooling. Again, many people can pull this off. It's great. Sometimes a little tougher than it should be. I don't really see many of these as being container friendly so far. Again, there's drips and drabs of support there. Some automated ops, right? And again, you can automate a lot of these things. Sometimes it's bolted on after the fact, but yes, you, can, you don't have to do human attended operations for this. And it's, a, it's been a widely available skill set. It just seems to ebb and flow. So I think you can find people to know these, but there's a pretty steep learning curve. So you just can't grab a random person off the street and tell them to, tell them to administer this, right? There's a, there's a learning curve. There's tools you need to use. ETL tools, right? I'm moving lots of data through pipelines. I'm processing data. I'm doing data quality things. 
I can use Informatica, Azure Data Factory, Google Cloud Data Fusion, lots of things here. Clearly they're for batch and bulk. They're not really for anything real time. You do get delivery guarantees, which is great. There's better connectivity now with some cloud hosted endpoints, some on-prem work as well. You can do some basic workflows. You're doing kind of data pipeline work in here. Some CI CD. I, I mean, again, I don't see this being terrific, but it's not bad. Also, I don't see a ton of container kind of friendliness here. These are big processing things. They need a lot of horsepower. They're probably not sitting in a bunch of containers that disappear. More and more automated ops in this space. And I think for the most part, this is a, a widely available skill set. People have been moving bulk data for a while. These tools have a lot of gravity to them. Function as a service platforms, right? Serverless compute that scales to zero. And you might say, this, is this an integration tool? I think it kind of is. When I look at Azure Functions, Google Cloud Run, Lambda, Knative, others, people are substituting full-fledged integrations for, hey, let me just listen on the event stream change from my DynamoDB database or my Cosmos DB database, and then just move it into another system. It's just a poor man's integration. I'm seeing that all the time. So people are replacing more heavyweight integrations with these light ones. These are not meant for batch. They are definitely more for the real-time integration from source systems when something changes. Some of these seem to have some delivery guarantees, but the tooling doesn't strike me as super great at, hey, what if I lose a message? I have to I really investigate a lot of things here. Good connectivity to cloud endpoints, of course. Many of these are cloud-hosted. On-prem, okay. Many of these are not designed for on-premises integration. You can do things like step functions. You can do a number of different tools here as well, durable functions to do some basic workflows. Definitely CI CD friendly for all these. K native and things like that are container centric, open FAS. Definitely automated operations. And again, a, a decent skill set. These are easy to pick up, but the question is do we know how to use them correctly yet? I think we're all still learning this as well. API gateway is the same thing. And again, don't accidentally turn your API gateway into an enterprise service bus. That, that's a bad pattern. But this can do a number of things that you still may do when you do API to API integration, right? I might say I'm going to have this system talk to this system through an API, that's totally valid. And again, it's not really a, bulk, a batch or bulk tool, but this is definitely a point-to-point -point solution sometimes with some real-time integration needs. Some delivery guarantees, not a ton. Again, you might have some cloud-hosted endpoints, which is good, right? Connect to that. Some for on-premises, you're talking HTTP. That's pretty straightforward stuff. Basic workflow support, basic CI, CD, and containers, automated ops, a lot of skill sets here. So this is still a tool to consider. The final one, communication frameworks, right? I'm doing more advanced remote procedure calls that actually do some of these integration friendly things. So things like RSocket, gRPC, this might even be a solution in some cases where I wanna do this and I don't wanna have a full fledged integration solution. So they're good for real time, absolutely. Some delivery guarantees, some integration, they're not workflow tools. Definitely CI CD friendly, container friendly, some automated operations. And of course, this is a new skill set. So there's a ton of stuff there. You're going to use all these different integration tools. I promise you, right? That's a normal thing. I guess my advice for you is choose when and how to choose. Have decision frameworks, know what's in here, but don't overwhelm yourself, right? Otherwise you're going to constantly be picking and repicking tools. So a lot of information. I hope this was fun. I'm going to hang out in the chat if you have any questions or Q&A, but this is a, again, as always, the most fun time ever to be an integrator. Just don't freak out because there's so much to choose between. Thank you all. Well, thank you, Richard. Indeed, uh, there are a couple of questions. Well, we can uh, take uh, one of these, uh, one or two of these questions. There are sure. five, six questions, so not that many. Do you have to screen it here? Sure, absolutely. Okay, fantastic. I see some of these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, do you want me to read them off or any of these that you're interested in? I see one about Kubernetes being de facto for integration scenarios. Uh, I, I think you're more and more, I mean, I don't know, me personally I think in three years, fewer of us will care about Kubernetes, but it will be more important than ever. Just fewer people will care about it because it becomes part of the substrate. So I think something that is important for us to become more familiar with, I wouldn't overinvest in learning it because more and more your things will run on top of it versus you having to communicate directly with it. Uh, let's see. Uh, Stevian talking about the data-driven trend and AI. I think absolutely AI is this sort of trend that, hey, can I do, you know, integration almost through AI and I'm, I'm looking at sources and destinations and creating some of these mappings. And, you know, I think that's absolutely true. Same with the amount of data, things like that. Something I just excluded for time. 
but clearly the sort of volume of data, the change in data, how AI works and how that might impact how we integrate. I think that's going to touch on all of us here in the coming future. I'm just a little bearish on how fast that's going to happen. All right. Uh, let's see. Any more of these other ones that I can tackle? Is RPA integration, Tom Cantor? Uh, robotic process automation? I mean, I think so. I think a lot of things are integration now, which is why the sort of kingdom of integrators is not as small as it maybe was 10 years ago. A lot of people are connecting a lot of things now. I think this includes it as well, even if robots are doing it. Yeah, true. Makes sense. Yeah. All right. Well, good. We'll still be here for chat and Q&A if people have questions. Other than that, I appreciate the time. Okay, fantastic. Well, uh, thanks again indeed, uh, Richard. Covey.com.